Genesis 3, just a few verses into what we're told is the fall. It says that God looked at Eve and said to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Let your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Pain, the first time it's ever used in all the scriptures. A new word introduced to this new narrative of creation, how we recreated creation. Where once giving was the currency of creation before the fall, taking now becomes the currency, replacing giving as our selfless natures are completely replaced by selfish. Pain is now the price paid when someone is taken from. The man is now taking from the woman. The woman is now taking from the man. Giving makes, becomes an effort, not second nature anymore. Pain, pain, is, pain is a bottomless void, leeching the love and life from their harmony. It seems impossible for them to find anything to fill the void in their very souls. They clamber for a new harmony, one that will work in this world under the sun, where giving now seems to cost more than what has been given them. They find the new currency that seems to satisfy the void, and that new currency is vengeance. The first murder brings what the murderer himself calls punishment. A vengeance must be required for this horrific crime. The first murderer needs assurance that vengeance taken out on him will be avenged. Vengeance seems to satisfy the void that pain is causing in the human soul. There now is a price to all what passes for love on this fallen planet. Even Eve believes that Seth is a payment back for the loss of Abel but it's a cruel hoax. Seth can never replace Abel. Abel was Abel. Seth is Seth. There's no repayment for pain. No repayment for loss. Vengeance is a hoax because she didn't just lose Abel that day, she also lost Cain. Because he now too is trying to live by this code of vengeance and he must leave others in order to be able to find safety from what he's done. He has to live out this new old way where constant pain creates a constant void that vengeance will never fill. It's a prison. We're enslaved in it as we try to stop violence with violence. Stop it pain by inflicting more pain. A father tries to live out a life of pain inflicted on him by his father by taking it out on his son. There's a debt crushing our souls. Someone will have to pay. A spiral that echoes through eternity with the words, on the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Fathers, sons, mothers, daughters, families, tribes, nations against nations, all have believed that pain can be comforted by inflicting more pain, that vengeance can fill the void. Paul looks in his own heart and says, I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched people that we are, who will save us from this body of death? Two weeks ago, the Kohelet the author, the bringer of wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes, concluded that when wisdom, or God's way, and, and, and again, uh, to, to, to clarify, when Solomon speaks of wisdom, he speaks of something that was given to him by God. He speaks of a way that God has to operate, that God has a will and a way. Believes the prophet when the prophet says, uh, it's speaking for, for God to Israel, my ways are not your ways. Solomon believes that too, and he calls it wisdom. God's way is wisdom. But he said a couple weeks ago, in, back in chapter eight, that when wisdom came up against earthly power, came up against a king, it was always going to lose. Because it doesn't have the home field advantage. God's ways are not at home here. Under the sun is not where God's governance rules. Kings rule here. 
kings that live by the very laws that vengeance brings about. And the Kohelet said, when that wisdom, no matter how wise, no matter who brings it, it comes up against the absolute power of a king, it's always going to lose. It will not win out. And he uses himself back in chapter two as as example. I wanted to make a difference. I had all of God's wisdom. I had all the gifts that he gave me. And when it came time to, to do it, I could not do anything that what had not been done before. Last week, he concluded that wisdom teaches. He finally said that the one thing that wisdom can win out on and teach right here is that it teaches those of us living that death is preferred to life under the sun. Because life under the sun is vexation. And the one thing death is that comes to everybody, the same fate awaits us all, is that at least we get to rest and have peace and stop the vexation and toil and oppression that plagues all who are living under the sun. The dead know none of this anymore. In fact, the only thing good about living, according to wisdom, according to our Kohelet, the only thing good about living is that knowing one day will die. So coming to those conclusions, what happens, how he concludes the rest of the chapter of chapter nine is extraordinary. This conclusion is extraordinary. This is really something after all he has concluded before. He says this, he says, but I've also, when he comes to the conclusion about death and all of that, he says, I've also seen this example of wisdom under the sun and it seemed great to me. The first great example that wisdom gives all of us is, and, and that we know that it's from God is that we know one day we're going to die. The dead know nothing but we know, the living know, that one day we're going to die. But he says, I've also seen this example. He only has one other example. It's almost like he's saying, you know what, I meant everything I said about being under the sun and the futility of it all, futility of futility, vain of vanities, all is vanity, all is futile, but there was this one time. There was this one other thing. There was this one time. And he tells this tale. There was a little city. A what? A little city. Little. Some of yours will say town. I like that. There's a little town. There's a village with how many people? Very few. Very few. And a great king. What kind of king? A great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. You get the picture, right? Little town, great king. Little town, great king. Not many people, very few, much less an army, but the king has siege works. He has a full military presence. There's only one way this can go, right? If I were to take a bet from you today, who are you betting on? You bet, not even even odds. You can't take the little town with no army, very few people. And this king goes nuts. He feels that the town needs to be seized, sieged, if you will, which means building siege ramps and, and, and making sure that nobody gets out and, and, and hunkering down and just waiting, waiting for them to starve or to die of thirst in order to be able to surrender. The king wants to show this town who's who, right? But amongst those tiny amount of people, those few people, there was a poor what? A poor wise man. And he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered the poor man. What? We just lost our bet. We lost our bet because there was one guy amongst that tiny little congregation who had God's what? Had his wisdom. He, he did it his way, God's way. 
it's not described. It just says that all he had was wisdom. And by the way, he's what? He's, is he rich? Does he have power? Does he have wealth? Was he able to hire a bunch of mercenaries to be able to drive this king away? No. He was what? He was poor. All he's got is what? God's wisdom. God's way of doing things. God's way of governance brought to be living under the sun. And it works. He delivers the city, but is he written up for it in the history books? No. In fact, we don't have an event like this anywhere. But I would venture to say, and this is just me, I would venture to say that this happened to Solomon. You have to understand that when you, by the time that Solomon takes the throne, his wealth and his power are so much, I'm not 100% sure, and I, I, I've looked cursory, I haven't looked real close, but I'm not 100% sure that there's a narrative of Solomon ever having to go to war. Do you, do you guys recall anything? I don't think he ever had to. For those of you who have been to the Holy Land and you, and you go to Megiddo, Megiddo was Solomon's main fortress. It guards the northern gates of Israel. And when you stand there at, at Megiddo and you see the mountains and you see the mountains and on the other side you know is Jordan and Syria and you think of how many centuries that the Assyrians and the Babylonians and every enemy just hauls through that little pass in Megiddo out into the valley of Jezreel and is able to, to take Israel captive and defeat them. But you go to Megiddo today and you dig down to where Solomon was, he had that thing fortified. Thousands of horses, hundreds of chariots, iron chariots. It's nothing but, it, it, right Mike, Marion? It's nothing but horse troughs. It's nothing but feed troughs, stone feed troughs all through this to, 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 to feed all this. And of course, if this happened to him, he's not gonna write it up right? I say it's just me. But I think Solomon is talking about an encounter that he tried. And when he took all that he had and put it up against this little town, and this one poor man with God's wisdom is able to defeat them. Of course, he's not, you're not going to find that in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. One commentator says he saved the town, but afterward his act was forgotten by the townspeople because they prefer not to think that their welfare had depended on the wisdom of a man of lowly status. Somebody's gonna come and ask us how we defeated this great king, and we don't wanna tell him that it was because of this poor old guy. So the Kohelet says, Wisdom is better than might, yet the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heeded. Better wisdom than might. The poor man's wisdom is scorned. The Kohelet takes us through still another dialectic turn. If wisdom does not come from a prestigious source, it's liable to be ignored or forgotten. Wisdom is a supreme value, according to Solomon. But given society's concern with status, if wisdom is not accompanied by prestige, it will have no audience. Sounds about the way it works here under the sun, doesn't it? If something extraordinary happens and, and, and we have to believe in the extraordinary, we're gonna take the other story. We'd rather even just ignore it if it isn't working out the way the rules under the sun should work out. Might makes what? Might makes right. Not in this case though, right? So I'd go one step further on this commentator who used the word prestige, that they, they don't acknowledge the old man because uh, it, it's, it's not prestigious enough. I, I wanna say this too. I really believe that the solution, whatever it was, didn't include violence, did it? Right? He's a poor, old man. He defeated a military enemy without a military. It couldn't have been a military victory. 
It couldn't have been a military victory. And if that's the case, then they may be free and they may have gotten rid of this great king, but it also means that having to tell people that there is no warning for anybody else who wants to try this. See, the great king can take his army back home, his military, and and signal to the world, don't try nothing with me. I got siege works. But this town, they can't tell that story, can they? They don't have that. So for them, it's just best to ignore this nonviolent approach, whatever this old man did. In fact, it's to the point to where his wisdom is disrespected, even amongst the people that he saved. So the quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one bungler destroys much good, he says. Siege, violence, war versus wisdom. Weapons, loud words, more threatening, high volumes, arguing, fighting, getting louder than someone else versus the quiet words of wisdom. I have to admit that I didn't think I would find in Ecclesiastes another confirmation of all the study that we've been through in the past two years on the tactics of the beasts in Revelation. A church that uses under the sun power mixed with the religious power of Christianity. The false church, the church of the dragon, the church of the two beasts versus the church of the lamb that was slain. And what did they do? They weaponized everything. They weaponized the very gospel. They take the sword of the word, the two-edged sword that's sharper than anything, and they turn it into an actual military weapon. They weaponized the cross, literally turning the cross into a sword. Constantine claimed to have the three nails that held Jesus to the cross, and he forms it into the handle of his sword. making Jesus himself into a military conquering king rather than the lamb that was slain. We studied prophetic history for two years uh, looking at, at the beast, both Catholic and Protestant, that from the 14th through the 17th centuries, both, both of them were laying hold of this uh, under the sun power in order to make themselves mighty and calling themselves a church. Both were laying siege to the remnant. One of the groups that were being uh, attacked, one of the rooms, uh, 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 groups that were under siege were, were some of my favorite uh, uh, people in all the Reformation. How many have heard of the Anabaptists? We should have all heard of them because if you go back to uh, reformers theology and its contribution to Adventist theology, Anabaptist is foundational. It's fundamental. We have more Anabaptist theology in Adventist theology than we do any other Reformation group. But the word Anna comes from the Greek that says again. They were derided because they had to be baptized again. Anabaptists. They didn't call themselves that. That's what they were called by the Protestant and, Re- and the, Re- the Reformers, the Protestant and Catholics, who were both persecuting them. Anabaptists require that baptismal candidates be able to make a confession of faith that is freely chosen and so rejected baptism of infants. In its first generation, converts submitted to a second baptism, which was a crime punishable by death under most legal codes in the old world. In order to be baptized as an adult, you risked your life to do it because most places forbade it. By capital punishment, you couldn't get baptized again. Members rejected the label Anabaptist or rebaptizer. As a matter of fact, Anabaptists would reject any label 
because they were afraid that once you named us, that would freeze us. They were non-credal. They would not accept a creed. They always left room for the Holy Spirit in their lives to be able to grow. They didn't even want a name. So if you called them an Anabaptist, they'd look at you and say, well, that's your name for me. Members rejected the label Anabaptist or rebaptized, for they repudiated their own baptism as infants as a blasphemous formality. The reason that they were just baptized once is because they said infant baptism was blasphemous. So it's like it never even happened. One of the early leaders, Balthazar Hobmeyer, in the 16th century said, I've never taught Anabaptism. But the right baptism of Christ, that's what I teach, which is preceded by teaching and oral confession of faith. I teach and say that infant baptism is a robbery of the right baptism of Christ. So you couldn't call an Anabaptist an Anabaptist. Most Anabaptists adhered to a literal interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 to 7, which teaches against hate, killing, violence, taking oaths, participating in use of force or any military actions, and against participation in civil government. Anabaptists view themselves as primarily citizens of the kingdom of God, not of earthly governments. As committed followers of Jesus, they seek to pattern their life after his. The Amish, Hutterites, and Mennonites are all direct descendants of the Anabaptist movement. Anabaptists were heavily persecuted by state churches, both magisterial Protestants and Roman Catholic, beginning in the 16th century and continuing thereafter largely because of their interpretation of scripture, which put them at odds with official state church interpretations and local government control. Anabaptism never, never was established by any state, and therefore they could not uh, be associated with any of its privileges. And they were persecuted by both, Catholics and Protestants. My favorite reformer, the only thing that I have against him was that he martyred the Baptists in in southern Switzerland, along with Calvin in northern Switzerland in Geneva. They were both martyring Anabaptists, along along with the persecution from the others. But what they decided was was that that persecution was a reason for witnessing. Because every time one was martyred, they'd win five more converts. I've told you the story before, was that at Lake Zurich or Lake Geneva, uh, the, the, um, the persecutors decided that if you're gonna be baptized again, well, we'll do it again. So they would take them and they would, they would put them in a sack and they would roll, uh, seal up the sack and they'd roll them out to the middle of the boat and they would throw, the middle of the lake and they would throw them in. You want to be baptized? Okay, we will. The problem was, was that from the time that they started to put the sack on them and put them in the boat and would reel them out, roll them out, it would take about 20 minutes. And in 20 minutes, every one of those soon to be martyrs had a pretty good sermon ready and they would preach all the way out. And when the persecutors began to row back after getting rid of this pest, they'd get to the shore and there would be five more in the water being baptized. They tried to take care of that by then eventually just cutting out their tongues. But I wanna say that, that uh, being martyred, being willing to do that, uh, being willing to, to, to live that way, I really believe that this is the 16th century, that it actually forced the beast to change tactics because the force and the fear and the coercion and martyring the believers, that was backfiring. It was winning more people than what it was getting rid of. The beast had to change tactics. So the beast from the land has a different tactic than the beast from the sea. He can't just be killing everybody. He could just pretend to be free. We talked about that. So from the fall 
Humanity begins living out this selfish nature now manifest, and we find it even more. We find even more reasons they find, we find. Humanity finds even more and more reasons to marginalize people and to practice this new paradigm of power, and it has immediate consequences, doesn't it? Immediate consequences. Sorry. Enable his part of the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, they had no regard. Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. One generation removed from the fall. This is Adam and Eve's first generation of children. When I teach this to kids, I ask them, why? Why was it that Cain felt he had to kill Abel? What do we say? He was jealous, right? He had envy. He was full of lust, pride, arrogance. Those are all emotions. Those are all emotions. So what I like to say is that he murdered him for nothing. Vanity. Simply living out something that he doesn't understand or hasn't fleshed out yet. He murders him for nothing. And what will the price be for one murder? What is the price? When Cain is told he can no longer belong and toil the field, he cries out that he is being, uh, had vengeance taken against him. He said, my punishment is too great to dare. It's it's, It's too great to bear. I can't do this. The vengeance is too much, he yells at God. And then the God said to him, not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Only the threat of seven more being murdered can now protect Cain from one. And that doesn't last long because Cain's grandson comes home one day and tells his wives that he just murdered a man for hitting him. A guy walked up to me and hit me, so I murdered him. And so he calls on the mark of his grandfather for protection, but he says this, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech, what? Seventyfold. The new paradigm of power is now 70 murders for one. Violence has no end in its toll in this under the sun paradigm. Hasn't that been what the Kohelet has been telling us? I look and I see nothing but vexation and oppression. Humanity has no choice but to live this out. Fear and coercion, fear to get people of free will to do what others want or need them to do in order to be safe is the curse of Lamech and Cain and the curse of humanity that you and I have been born into. So much that within 10 generations of the fall, just 10, God pronounces this upon the creation. The earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was what? Filled with violence. It's a huge encompassing word. It's every kind of violence that you can think of. War, sexual, emotional, abusive, any time that somebody used and coerced somebody, uh, uh, tried to coerce their will, this was the word, violence, mabul. It took 10 generations to get humanity down to eight heartbeats who might be willing to listen to the wisdom of God. Eight heartbeats. Which, by the way, to me, completely changes how I look upon the flood. The flood then becomes the only act of mercy that we gave God to work with. It slows down the paradigm long enough to get humanity to recognize something, to examine and question our instincts as to whether or not they're right. Buy us some time, please, at least 6,000 years so that God can show up and show us that our instincts are wrong. So 
Sermon on the Mount comes early in Jesus' ministry. When he does show up, it comes early. He comes to show that under the sun rules of governance does not and will never work in the kingdom that he is bringing. It's almost a warning. His life is a warning to us. You think that you can bring those instincts into the kingdom of heaven. I'm sorry, but you can't. He even shows how living God's words on paper, living by the letter of the law, righteousness, and otherwise weaponizing the Bible to make one appear better is no standard a disciple shall fight and live by. I thank you, O oh Lord, I'm not like that tax collector over there. A Pharisee that only relates, a believer that only relates to God by what's written on the page. I'm not a thief, I'm not a rogue, I'm not an adulterer. Jesus began that parable saying that that guy who tries to relate to God by the letter of the law, he's not even praying to God. He's praying thus to himself. But the tax collector can't even lift his head towards heaven, beating his chest, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. This is the man who goes to his house made right with God. This is a man who's fought every one of the selfish instincts to fight back, to make it harder, to make someone pay. So Jesus begins with going after this standard of righteousness with a phrase that he'll use a few times. And Mike said it when when he started scripture reading. You have heard that it was said. You, you, You know what's written, right? You know what's written in the Ten Commandments and the law. You know what's written. But what? I say to you. Is he allowed to do that? Well, he wrote the first one. And now the first one is living in his heart, so yeah, he's allowed to do that. And he does it a few times. This is what the law says on paper, and then he says, and what I say and do fulfills it. That's what he's saying every time he says, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. So you've heard this said that those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. That's a good law, by the way. Isn't it? Most every uh, civilization that we've had as far as we can go back has had some sort of law against murder. That's a pretty good law. You shall not murder and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you're angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. If you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you'll be liable to what? The hell of fire. Find me a law written in any civilized law that says <laughs> if you're angry with someone, you're liable to judgment of hellfire. In other words, punishable by capital punishment. And, by the way, you're condemned eternally. Anybody have a law written like that? No, we usually stop at the life taking part, right? But Jesus says, hey, Where does the instinct and the impulse for murder come from? It comes from within. Usually begins with a war of words, by the way. Usually begins with an insult. And then it escalates. And then the spiral takes over. And then the instinct takes over. So Jesus said, why not go to the matter of the heart? Why not cleanse the heart and not even be angry with anybody? Because it's too scary to think about, isn't it? So the solution would be not to act, but Jesus says, don't just act, but go even further. Feel, he said. When you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister is something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come offer your gift. Reconcile and be reconciled. Don't even go to church with that on your heart, he says. Don't even try to worship me with that on your heart. Cleanse your heart. Go reconcile with your brother. Come back to me and, and, and now we can talk. Reconcile and be reconciled. Not simply what we do, it becomes who we are. 
Paul puts it this way, if anyone is in Christ, there is a, what kind of creation? A new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled himself to, to us to himself through Christ, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. We're the only ones that know what it's like to be reconciled to God. We're the only ones that are allowed to tell anybody else what it's like. Because no one else knows what it's like. And by the way, self-righteous people don't know what it's like. Not just physical war and violence, but as far as the commandment takes us, even to anger and insults. It goes from the letter of the law to where? To my very heart, to who I am. What does the insult do? It injures another. It's not just that it can spiral away. It's not just that it could spiral and end up uh, becoming actual physical murder. You and I know better than anybody that insults kill, don't they? Most of us, most of us probably would be fortunate enough to never have to face any sort of physical violence of any magnitude against us. Our hurt and our pain, 90% of it comes from what people have said to us or about us. Amen? Jesus said words are not just words. When you insult somebody, you kill them. By the way, one of the other reasons that the Kohelet said we're better off dead is because it silences those insults. The problem with insults is that if you murder somebody, at least they're dead. You insult somebody, they have to listen to that insult for as long as they're living under the sun. But usually what happens when we're insulted? We do what? We retaliate, we have to protect ourselves. We retaliate in kind, usually maybe with just a little bit more, just to keep the ball rolling, right? And we respond in kind. But what did Jesus say a peacemaker does when we're violated? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. What's a peacemaker do when he's violated? Right here. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, do what? Turn the other also. Again, the law as a standard says that it's legal to retaliate as long as you retaliate in kind. On paper, that's the way it should be done. But these kinds of laws, betrayal and violence against somebody, it doesn't happen on paper, does it? It happens in the human heart. On paper, the law says that now the two parties are even and reconciled. But what doesn't it do? It doesn't do anything to the heart. Nothing close. Violence does not work that way, and Jesus knows it, and you and I know it. I'm in a righteous state for the moment. I am minding my own business, and someone walks up to me and hits me. He may have a perfectly good reason for doing so, but my stinging cheek is not 100% sure. And it's not getting at that reason, whatever it is. And I'm thinking, if I'm thinking at all, I might be thinking, you know what? The law does allow me to retaliate. Retaliate as long as I, it's in kind. So I return it. The other person now has another reason on top of his original reason to What? to retaliate, to hit me again. Violence is a spiral that the law doesn't stop. But note what turning the other cheek can do. At least it stops the cycle. Now you may get hit again. In fact, you may get hit again. But at least we are no longer the ones that is fueling the retaliation. Hopefully they get tired before they kill me. 
But usually what happens is that they begin to recognize something. And by the way, the great peacemakers of our generation, men like Gandhi and Martin Luther King and John Lewis, they knew that. It does something. It wasn't just enough to stop the violence here. They were concerned enough about the violent people's hearts. They wanted something to happen to them. That's a love I can't imagine. And they were willing to risk everything to make it happen. Cheeks and teeth and eyes and even their own lives. Greater love has no man than one who's willing to lay down his life. Don't, re, don't give any fuel to the retaliation, he says. If anyone wants to sue you to take your coat, give your cloak as well. Won't that disarm somebody who's looking to cause you harm? I'm gonna sue you for a million dollars. Well, here's a million five. Whoa, what, what just happened? Right? At least it disarms them. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Make them tell you to go back home. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. I used to say here that it changes the other person, but it doesn't. It just gives the other person an opportunity to address their current state that my retaliation definitely won't. My retaliation will slam the door on that process immediately. And there's only one way that the possibilities remain open is that we not resist. You've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be what? Children of your Father in heaven. You wanna know what it's like to live on this, under the sun, under the kingdom's rules? Our Father is the one that rules the kingdom of heaven. He wants that kingdom to be on this kingdom. If we wanna be his children, this is who we become. He makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, under the sun. The Kohelet knows what it's like to live here. He's been telling us what it's like to live here. The problem here is that nobody gets what they deserve. The rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. Then he goes even further. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? By the way, he went straight for the jugular on that one. Let's name the worst sinner that they can think of. You just compared my love to the worst sinner you can think of? Yeah. They love people who love them. Jesus said, I died for people who hated me. If you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Man, oh man. It just keeps coming, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but I'm drained. I'm absolutely drained. No way, no how. Is anybody here close? You telling me I can't retaliate? I can't do what I want? What I'm willing to forgive is so far short of who I am and supposed to be, which by the way then, when we get to this point, when we realize it, guess what? We get to be driven all the way back to the very first beatitude that says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus says, welcome back, man. I told you, you got nothing. You gotta come to me to be filled every day. How'd you do today? How'd you do yesterday? I didn't even come close, Lord. Well, welcome back. Let me fill you with my love, my atonement, my forgiveness. Ask me forgiveness and I'll send you back out there. And by the way, when you go back out, you're one day sooner for me to come back and put an end to this. Yet here we are. 
That's what I found in these words. I've seen this example of wisdom under the sun and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few people. A great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered the poor man. I'm gonna leave that up there. I'm gonna want you to leave that up there. And I want you to listen to these words and then tell me who this reminds you of. Who's he talking about? What is he talking about? Who's believed what we heard, the prophet says? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others. A man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity and one as with whom others hide their faces. He was despised and we held him of no account. He doesn't look the part of a king. He doesn't look the part of a ruler. There's nothing about him that we would be attracted to him. But surely he's borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we account him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. And all like sheep have gone astray. And all have turned our own way. Yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter. Like a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Who do you think the poor man is in the story? That poor guy, he's the one that delivers us. Psh. He's not even respected by the people that he actually saved. Why were we yet enemies? Christ died for us. The kingdom doesn't live by the might of military siege works, but by a poor man armed with nothing but love. Wisdom. He comes to save everyone, saves his little town, but even those in the town forget him and despise his words and his wisdom. Did Solomon actually see the Messiah through prophecy and history here? I don't believe so. I really don't. That would be reading too much into that. But there is what under the sun calls the king of kings. Solomon at least is trying to point out to us, I was that mighty king. I was the one that was king of kings. Solomon's referred to as king of kings, but the actual king of kings was the poor man who saved his people. He doesn't look it. He doesn't look like it. He's got some crazy ideas about how to fight a war. Fight a war by not fighting it? Where's this guy from? Yeah. Where's this guy from? It's a beautiful time to hear the words to us from under the sun. That even all the way back in the lips of the Kohelet, God wants us to know. He wants us to be comforted. He wants us to find just a little bit of peace just one example of wisdom under the sun. Thanks for holding on with me the extra time. I'll miss you all. I'll miss you all, but I'll see you in a couple weeks. Happy Sabbath.